Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. On the show tonight. Uh, these ridiculous, unethical, illegal mask mandates. A Republican candidate for governor's public message on masking contradicts the policy of his own family business. Casino sites, gas card giveaways, and an ethics package. Older people have plenty to weigh ahead of tomorrow's city council meeting. Why is it that we're unwilling to protect infants and toddlers? WTTW News finds a lack of systemic COVID tracking at daycares. A look at the impact on children and their parents. A disturbing new report finds anti-Semitic incidents are at an all-time high across the nation and here in the Midwest. Your water bill might start to look different. Hear why in an exclusive one-on-one -on -one with the city's water commissioner. And Chicago's oldest African-American camera club focuses on the history and natural beauty of Washington Park. But first, some of today's top stories. Vice President Kamala Harris announces she's tested positive for COVID. Harris released a statement today saying she has no symptoms and will isolate following CDC guidelines. She also noted that she is both vaccinated and boosted. Harris returned to Washington yesterday after a week-long trip in her home state of California. White House officials say COVID contact tracing is underway. The Chicago Reader is free, according to the Alternative Newspaper's staff. The announcement came after Reader co-owner Leonard Goodman said he'd be stepping down along with three board members. In a statement, Goodman says, quote, we were now at the end of the road. We cannot continue the fight without destroying the Reader. I am stepping aside. The move comes after a protest from the staff last week. The paper had been on track to switch over to a nonprofit model, but contention stemming from an op-ed column Goodman wrote on vaccines has held it up. The paper is now expected to move forward with becoming a nonprofit model. Facing a potential playoff elimination, the Bulls may be a bit shorthanded tomorrow night. The Bulls announce all-star Zach Levine is entering the league's COVID health and safety protocols. Bulls coach Billy Donovan says Levine will undergo testing after not feeling well this morning. He will not travel with the team to Milwaukee as the Bulls play game five against the Bucks, and it is a must win if the Bulls want to keep the seven game series alive. Bulls announced just yesterday that guard Alex Caruso is in concussion protocol and questionable for game five. Up next is gubernatorial candidate Darren Bailey sending mixed messages about his stance on masking. Stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols. The Jim and Kay Maybe family. The Polk Brothers Foundation. And the support of these donors. Governor J.B. Pritzker doesn't have any competition in the June Democratic primary, but on the Republican side, there's a divisive battle over who will win the nomination to take on Pritzker come November. Pritzker's handling of the coronavirus pandemic is among Republican criticisms. Amanda Vinicky joins us now with a look at one of the leading candidates seemingly conflicting positions on COVID protocols. Amanda. Yeah, Paris, gubernatorial candidate and state senator Darren Bailey has made a name for himself fighting the governor's executive orders that require faces be covered in places like theaters, stores, and schools. Early in the pandemic, his legislative colleagues even kicked Bailey out. There are 81 voting yes, 27 voting no, and one voting present. Representative Bailey will be removed from the House floor Dorman, please remove Representative Bailey. That was spring of 2020 when the Illinois General Assembly was first meeting in person since the start of COVID. It was just months into the pandemic. Bailey refused to abide by the chamber's new rules that required legislators wear masks. So his colleagues voted he'd be removed from the proceedings. Political scientist Chris Mooney says it was a politically savvy move. It's not like they're going to hog tie him and throw him down on the ground. Uh, but it was noted, you guys in the press noted it, suddenly he gets a little pop, he can be anti-mask, fits in with the base that he's trying to appeal to. Bailey has since worn his mask at the Capitol without issue as has often been required. But last night at a GOP candidates forum, forum that is, Bailey boasted about his mask protest a couple years back. I was the only person that stood up and escorted out of the General Assembly 
I've been standing up and pushing back and trying to educate parents from day one to take back your schools. When we allow government to get out of control, we lose our freedoms. Bailey has often pushed back against mask orders and statewide mandates. In my argument from day one, I understand and acknowledge that things are much different in Chicago. I get that because there's a lot more people up in the northern part of the state. But uh, when you live down here in southeast Illinois like I do, and you realize something's wrong and we need to treat things a little bit differently in certain parts of the state. Now, despite his walkout, lawsuits, and campaign rhetoric, masks have, during pockets of time throughout the pandemic, been required in Bailey's district and specifically by workers on the Bailey family farm, of which Darren Bailey is trustee. When farms bring on seasonal workers, say for the harvest, they have to file employment condition forms with the Department of Labor. The Bailey Farm has been hiring from overseas during the pandemic and is doing so now for jobs through June at $15.89 an hour. The Baileys require migrant workers wear masks, especially if they cannot keep six feet apart. But Bailey's Farm did not have to go that far. While the federal government has issued extensive guidelines on COVID, include other farms, including another in local Xenia, list no such COVID requirements. A Department of Labor spokesperson says to the extent there are COVID protocols listed in agricultural clearance orders, they are either voluntary protocols put in place by the employer in response to guidelines, or they're necessary to comply with state or local health and safety requirements. Including COVID precautions is rational from a business perspective, says political scientist Mooney. He, he knows that his business will be hit if workers get sick and they infect each other. He needs, and you know, agriculture is particularly a timely, uh, you know, you need to, things have to be done at a certain time, right? Or there's a problem. And so uh, it's absolutely uh, legitimate, it's legal. But Mooney says in the case of winning a Republican primary, it's not necessarily about rationale. It is about symbolism. Bailey has always been consistent. It is a business's right to implement a mask order if they so choose. They should do, be able to do what they want, he says. He is against government interference. Still, Bailey's Republican opponents, Richard Irvin, Gary Rabine, Paul Schimpf, and Jesse Sullivan, can point to it as hypocrisy, Mooney says. The Republican primary for the governorship right now is, is a battle between who can be the most Trumpy, right? Who can be the most like Donald Trump? And so this is what, this is what he is doing. Donald Trump eschewed masks. We did reach out to Bailey's campaign to see how his farms policy has squared with his campaign stance. They sent back a statement saying that before COVID, the farm did supply N95 masks and more, the campaign says, to those who needed them for farm work. Senator Bailey's stance is very consistent, as he has always stood against tyrannical government mandates and for the rights of businesses and individuals to make good decisions for themselves. The campaign says also, saying it should come as no surprise. This is farm work, so mostly done outside. The Baileys farm over 12,000 acres, so social distancing comes naturally. The H-2A is a federal program that legally brings migrant workers, and they're required to abide by federal rules and make available to workers whenever they need. The Bailey Family Farm employs several local families and continues to advertise jobs locally to fill positions, but no one wants to work. Again, that is the response from the Bailey campaign. With that, Paris, sending it back to you. Thanks, Amanda. Tomorrow, City Council meets, and one issue top of mind is Mayor Lori Lightfoot's plan to use $12 million in city funds to give away prepaid gas cards and CTA passes. Another top issue outside of tomorrow's meeting is the search for the city's casino. Yesterday, the special committee on the casino met. And joining us to talk about all of this and more are Alderman Brian Hopkins of the 2nd Ward on the north side, Alderman Gilbert Viegas of the northwest side, 36th Ward and chair of the Latino Caucus, 
Alderman Pat Dowell, who represents the 3rd Ward on the near south side, and Alderman Jason Irvin, representing the 28th Ward on the west side and chair of the Council's Black Caucus. Welcome all of you back to Chicago tonight. Good to see you. I want to start, before we get to those other things, Alderman Hopkins, with the violence this weekend, the, the most violent weekend of the year so far, also the warmest weekend of the year, and we saw those uh, groups of troublemakers uh, along Michigan Avenue near Millennium Park. CPD said that it had been prepared for that. What happened? They were prepared. We had a plan to deal with it, but the plan required a larger number of patrol officers on the ground to respond to the size of the crowd. It was approaching 500 at its peak, um, and we weren't quite expecting 500. We could have probably handled, say, less than 200, maybe 150. Uh, the plan and the resources would have been adequate, but we were simply outnumbered, uh, and we just couldn't respond quick enough. Alder Woman Dowell, what do you need to hear from the police department uh, to give you confidence that this summer won't be as violent as last summer's as, as we're looking at the weather warming up eventually here? Well, you know, as we approach summer, you know, we all get a little worried about what's going on in our respective wards. Um, what I need to hear from the CPD is that they're prepared uh, to handle some of the things that we experience in the third ward. Uh, for example, unauthorized uh, gatherings uh, near parks, um, uh, motorcycles riding down Michigan Avenue. Um, those are the main uh, uh, problems that we see during the summer. We have begun to have conversations with some of our commanders to put in uh, measurements related to parking, um, talking to our commanders about um, signage and all of those things. But the real issue is being prepared for uh, these crowds that, uh, as Brian Hopkins says, you never know what the size of those crowds are going to be. So a lot, to, a, a lot to be concerned about uh, as, uh, as we get warmer here. Uh, Alderman Irvin, I want to turn to the casinos. It looks like so far that uh, all three of the casino proposals will get a no vote from the alder people that represent those specific wards. Is any one of these proposals going to pass city council? Well, I think that we're very early in the process uh, as it relates to the casino proposals, and uh, we really have to dive into the details of them all. Um, there were some initial uh, pieces that were done, which were outlined in the uh, booklet that was given to all of the members of council. I know that they're based on public input in the community meetings. There have been uh, other asks of the casino operators, and uh, we'll see what the best and final offers look like uh, from all three parties. And uh, Alderman Viegas, uh, we're hearing reports now that the uh, Bally's had offered $25,000 up front, and now the city's actually uh, soliciting $75,000 up front in cash from the winner. What exactly is that about? Well, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. What, are you sure it was $75,000? Well, that was million. Yeah, million. I'm sorry, yeah, 75 million. $75 Yeah, million. I was just going to say. Uh, $75,000 so, uh, would be a drop in the bucket. You're right. Yeah, if that's the case, we all would buy one. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so $75 million, uh, I, I think I think it's really just to, you know, let them know that they're, they have really skin in the game. You know, yesterday's, um, yesterday's uh, meeting that took place, you heard from a lot of the colleagues uh, that we want something. We just don't know what it is yet. Uh, I would have liked to have seen all five proposals and not just three because uh, I really want, would have wanted to see... Uh, what, what the uh, the cost value would have been for the city uh, from all five proposals and, and not just three. And also what we saw out of that um, uh, hearing yesterday was that this is a union town uh, and that we want to make sure that uh, there are PLAs in place. We want to make sure that there's car check neutrality in place. We want to make sure that working families are going to be working uh, at this at these projects. Uh, and, and, and if it's not union, I'm telling you right now, it's a, it's a no go for me. All right, so, so that's a big uh, issue for you is that those jobs are going to be union. Now, Alderman Hopkins, you've come out against the Bally's proposal at the Chicago Tribune printing press site. How come? Well, the overwhelming opposition from my community, um, Alderman Riley, my neighboring alderman, uh, did a survey. One of the more prominent residents associations also did a survey. Uh, it came back about 80% of the residents are strongly opposed. It's not even close. I can't swim against such a tide of opposition in my neighborhood, and I'm not going to, nor should I. That's my job is, is it the elected official. I'm supposed to represent uh, the prevailing sentiments of the neighborhood, and, and it's clear on this one. There, there really isn't uh, any room for doubt. Uh, so I came out against uh, that particular site, uh, primarily due to the traffic congestion and some of the other issues. 
Um, I have not yet taken a position in favor of anyone, but after the meeting yesterday, I'm prepared to announce for the first time on this show, I'll say it, um, I am in support of the 78 Rivers Casino. I believe that is the best proposal I've seen so far, um, and it's the right thing to do for the city. All right, the 78 Rivers uh, proposal, which would be uh, on Roosevelt Road there. Uh, Alderwoman Dowell, uh, you've come out against the Hard Rock proposal, which would be at the one central development yet to be built over the train tracks there near Soldier Field. Uh, how come? Uh, for some of the same reasons that I'm hearing from my colleague, uh, my constituents are overwhelmingly opposed to the Hard Rock Casino proposal um, for reasons of, you know, having such a large entertainment, 24-hour entertainment destination location adjacent to a family-friendly residential community, um, right close to uh, the backyards and uh, patios and balconies of many of my constituents. Um, we have to deal with issues related to congestion, uh, with that they experience all year, you know, long when the, when the bears are playing, to congestion and parking issues, uh, to concerns that they, that they have for litter, noise, uh, bright lights, crime. Um, all of these uh, matters have to be uh, carefully considered. You know, it's unusual, I think, to put a uh, casino smack dab up against a residential community. You know, when I think of uh, casinos, you know, I think of the Horseshoe or, or Rivers Casino out in Rosemont. Those are in business areas, industrial areas, and not in residential communities. So um, we're going to have to take a hard look at the other two on the table, but right now the Hard Rock uh, proposal um, in my community is dead on arrival. All right, and as uh, Alderman Irvin mentioned, still earlier in the early in the process here, I want to move on to the gas cards because that's going to get a vote tomorrow. That twelve million dollar gas giveaway program, Alderman Irvin, it barely cleared committee. Uh, is it going to have the votes to pass tomorrow? I believe it will have the votes to pass because we know that many uh, members of our communities are, are hurting. I think the changes in looking at the uh, low mobility uh, areas. Uh, the red and the uh, orange areas on the map, I think, will help because these are individuals that, in many cases, uh, don't view public transportation as the best option and tend to drive. And so, and we know that our, our residents are having challenges, and I think this is something that uh, we can do that's positive and, and works in their benefit. I think that, the, you know, voting against this really is voting against the interests of our, our constituents throughout the city. So I'm hopeful and I believe that the votes will be there tomorrow to pass it. Alderman Villegas, uh, what can you tell constituents about how this will work and, and whether it will go to the folks that really need it the most? Yeah, I think that, um, I think that it will pass uh, tomorrow as well, uh, given that there's been a little bit of an expansion in the areas that will capture uh, more folks that are hurting. Uh, you know, I would have rather seen the additional $12.5 million gone to the uh, Guaranteed Basic Income Pilot uh, so that way we could have helped additional families, not just for two or three weeks, but really for a whole year. Uh, so as much as I would have liked to see it gone to that program, uh, I'll be supporting this uh, gas card initiative because now it captures additional families and uh, our office will be ready to uh, d disseminate information uh, and help folks uh, apply for the lottery. All right, well, we'll watch that vote tomorrow, and we'll have to leave it there for now. But we'll be joined again by the Chicago City Council members later in the program to discuss ethics and much more. But for now, our thanks to older people Brian Hopkins, Gilbert Villegas, Pat Dowell, and Jason Irvin. And up next, historic levels of anti-Semitism across the country. Stay with us for more on that new report. Thousands of Puerto Ricans are taking to the streets to protest massive blackouts. Over the years, Mexican culture, from food to music, has become woven into the city's tapestry. Medical professionals share the latest recommendations on COVID-19 booster shots. DACA recipients have been facing longer delays than normal in their status renewal. Little Village is one of my favorite neighborhoods. This neighborhood comes together to celebrate such an important day in our culture. A disturbing report from the Anti-Defamation League finds anti-Semitic incidents have reached historic highs across the U.S. 
The ADL says more than 2,700 incidents targeting American Jews were recorded last year. That marks the highest total since it began tracking such data in 1979. The Midwest chapter of the ADL, which focuses on Illinois, Indiana, Minnesota, the Dakotas, and Wisconsin, reported a total of 175 anti-Semitic incidents in 2021. That's up 62 percent from the 108 cases it recorded the year before and more than 200 percent higher than five years ago. Joining us now to talk about this rising tide of anti-Semitism are David Goldenberg, Midwest Regional Director of the Anti-Defamation League, and Erez Cohen, Executive Director of Illini Hillel at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Thank you to you both for joining us. David Goldenberg, let's start with you first, please. Obviously, these numbers uh, that have been recorded are alarming, uh, but what about those incidents that go unreported? Are you concerned that it's, it's actually higher? We're obviously concerned because we always want to have an accurate number. We know from the FBI that roughly 40% of all hate crimes go unreported. But one of the things that I think is important that while this number is actually probably lower than the actual number, we think that the trends in general are, are accurate. So while we've seen the year over year increases in the dramatic way, in Illinois, we've seen a 430% increase in anti-Semitic incidents over the last five years. So we think that trend is very real, even if the percentage is high. David, what do you think is driving the surge? So I think there's three big things. Number one, first and foremost, the spread of hate and anti-Semitism and misinformation on social media. Number two, I think the loss of civil discourse that we've seen over the years and the intensity around political debates. Number three, I also think there's just general ignorance out there. And especially over the last couple of years where people were essentially holed up in their homes, they were engaging with fewer and fewer people living on social media. So to the effort needs to be uh, given to be exposed to people who are different than you, who have different ideologies, different religions. And I think that ignorance is driving a, an element of this as well. Eris Cohen, what's been your experience with anti-Semitism at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign? So, so for, the, the, for the past five years, we've seen a, a, a great increase in the number of anti-Semitic incidents. And to the earlier uh, question about reporting, we also know that some of the incidents go unreported. Um, for example, just yesterday, uh, we were dealing with an issue of a student that threw rocks at students that were at Hillel uh, during a, a rally, and we're, we're in constant contact with the police around this topic. Um, and this is, these are ongoing issues on our campus. David Cohen, um, you know, as we've seen, the numbers are on the rise in the Midwest, but uh, what has uh, been the law enforcement response uh, to these incidents? Does it seem like the courts are, are prosecuting people for committing them? So, so go for it, Ares. Uh, no, no, go, David. Sorry. Oh, Brandy, who did you want to? <laughs> David, go ahead, please. Why don't you answer that one? Oh, no, very sorry. So I think one of the things that we're seeing is that in communities where there are large populations of Jews who have cultivated relationships with law enforcement, they generally have been quite responsive. But in some cases where they're not so experienced in, in, in hate crimes and investigating hate crimes, they've got, all, they've got a long way to go. And Erez, uh, you know, directing a somewhat similar question to you, how has the administration at the university responded uh, to some of these incidents and to this increase in uh, anti-Semitism? So we are in constant working relationship with the university around this. There is obviously a lot of education that needs to happen. And we are really looking at this as an opportunity for, um, for learning, uh, for the university to take more leadership and to support the students in a way that they feel seen and heard and supported. Um, some, some events are better handled than others. And we see, we learn from other universities as well. Uh, Eastern Illinois University gave no trespassing orders to uh, people that threw uh, anti-Semitic flyers on the ground. Indiana University helped put mezuzahs on doors uh, in, in the dorms. We're hoping to see similar um, leadership coming from our administration as well. And Erez, how much do you think the events uh, in Israel and the ongoing conflict with Palestinians seem to drive the anti-Semitism that you see here? We definitely see a growing anti-Semitism around the time that uh, things turn to heat up in the Middle East. 
and uh, uh, specifically anti-Zionist arguments that basically rule out the, the Jewish right for self-determination has become a, a, an engine for anti-Semitism on our campus. It's very concerning, and sometimes it's even university funded, which is unacceptable uh, on the level of students, faculty, and staff that are Jewish and experience this type of bias on a regular basis. David Goldenberg, same question uh, with regards to, you know, what's happening in Israel and uh, what impact, you know, events of the last year have had on uh, the rise that you all have, have analyzed. Absolutely. So during the most recent conflict between Israel and Hamas back in May of last year, we tracked a more than 114 percent year over year increase from May 2021 to compared to May 2020. And so certainly there was a spike that we saw as, as it relates to anti-Semitic incidents tied directly to that conflict. But one of the things that we did have also seen, though, is that it is quickly turning from legitimate critiques of Israel into the targeting of Jewish institutions, Jewish cultural institutions, which in and of itself is an act of anti-Semitism. And then it translates into that rock throwing incident that Eris talked about, it becomes an act of violence. And so American Jews are concerned. David, we've also seen a market rise in uh, white supremacist sentiment. How much of a factor is that? It, it plays as much of a factor, if perhaps not more, um, as far as the rise of anti-Semitism. But the thing about it, though, is that just in those two questions, you talked about sort of the extreme parts of different political ideologies, and many in American Jews are essentially being squeezed from both sides. You have white supremacist propaganda, the spread of anti-Semitic propaganda as well, and also vandalism and harassment that is driven. Because when you look at anti-Semitism, it really is not even at the core of white supremacist ideology, but actually the core of white supremacist ideology. And then on the extreme left, you start seeing a lot of those in the progressive movement that have adopted um, sort of a, an anti-Israel uh, policy approach. And that's okay to be critical of Israel, but when that becomes acts of anti-Semitism, that's when we have a problem. Uh, Erez, what has been, you know, sort of the response of the Jewish community and, and in particular, you know, the, the students there at, uh, at the university and how they've responded to, to some of these events? So interestingly, we actually see a lot more activity within the Hillel. More students come to Hillel to get involved. But at the same time, they become less and less visibly Jewish on campus. They hide Jewish symbols that they wear. They try not to associate with, with different uh, Jewish uh, student organizations on campus. Uh, so this is this is a moment in time where the Jewish community is kind of shying away from the public eye, but is uh, coming coming to Jewish institution for more support. And David, you know, we've got a few seconds left, but you know, what do you think when you hear something like what Erez just told us? It's heartbreaking, and it's the reality of the American Jewish experience today. And that is for students to think about it, that they're afraid to embrace or concerned about embracing a critically important part of their identity because, out of, because they have concerns that they will be attacked or harassed. That is a huge problem. And okay. so as we think about where we go from here, we've got to realize that that's a reality and it's going to take a whole society approach to deal with it. And something that ADL will continue to track, I'm sure. Uh, that's where we'll have to leave it. My thanks to David Goldenberg and Eris Cohen for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. And now, Paris, we toss it back to you. All right, thanks, Brandis. And still to come on Chicago Tonight, WTTW News has learned local public health officials are not tracking COVID outbreaks at daycares. A look at the impact on children and parents. Ward maps and an ethics proposal. Members of City Council discussed that and much more ahead of tomorrow's City Council meeting. Water meter installations are officially resuming. After three years, we have an exclusive one-on-one -on -one with the city's water commissioner. And a camera club finds inspiration in the natural beauty of Southside Parks and the history of Chicago landscape architecture. But first, some more of today's top stories. A city employee is being charged with gun possession and official misconduct. Charles Sikanich, who is the ward superintendent for embattled 45th Ward Alderman James Gardner, is accused of trying to sell a machine gun to an undercover ATF agent while in a city vehicle and on the clock for his streets and sanitation job. In announcing the felony charges today, Attorney General Kwame Raoul released a statement saying, quote, 
seeking to illegally sell a dangerous firearm like a machine gun demonstrates at best indifference toward the public safety. However, to do so on government time using government property demonstrates a shocking disregard for the people government employees have committed to serve. According to his arrest report, Sikanich repeatedly asked to contact 45th Ward Alderman Jim Gardner while being placed into custody. WTTW has reported that Gardner is under investigation himself by the FBI, Chicago Board of Ethics, Circuit Court Clerk's Office, and Office of Chicago Inspector General. A new report from that watchdog, the Inspector General, says the Chicago Fire Department is correcting a culture of discrimination but still has work to do. The Chicago Fire Department, which is 91% male and 64% white, has been the subject of numerous racial discrimination and sexual harassment lawsuits over the years. This triggered a list of corrective actions by the Inspector General's office relating to training and employee protections. Today, Acting Inspector General William Marbach says only one of those five directives has been fully adapted by the department. Among those lacking is the appointment of a diversity, equity, and inclusion officer, as well as a trauma-informed training for staff handling discrimination and sexual harassment complaints. It's springtime and the city's cherry blossoms are starting to bloom. That's according to the Chicago Park District, which says more than 160 cherry trees in Jackson Park are blooming, revealing vibrant pink and white petals. The agency says the warmer weather this week should have cherry blossoms in full bloom for the next six to 10 days, although we are dreading that possible snow tomorrow. The Park District is honoring the Japanese tradition of Hanami Sakura, or flower watching, with a celebration in Jackson Park this Sunday from noon to 3 p.m. And you can visit our website to learn more. And now to brand us for a special WTTW news finding on COVID-19 and daycares. Brandis. Paris, Chicago parents of toddlers and babies are having to make tough decisions when sending their little ones to daycare centers. That's because the city's Department of Public Health is not systematically tracking COVID-19 outbreaks at those facilities as COVID-19 cases are rising. WTTW News reporter Heather Sharon joins us now with a look at what she found and how one Chicago mother coped with her son's illness. Heather, welcome back. Uh, first, tell us what do we know about COVID-19 in daycare centers? Well, we don't know much because of that lack of systemic data. Now, the Chicago Department of Public Health requires daycare centers and early childhood schools to report when they have had two or more cases of COVID-19 within 14 days. The problem is, is that's really a request. City officials can't enforce that requirement and there are no consequences for not reporting it. The other issue is that that data is not available to Chicago parents who are struggling to decide whether it's safe for their kid to go to daycare. WTTW News was able to, rec to obtain some data which shows that there were nine cases January through March, but even city officials acknowledge that is likely an undercount, which leaves parents flying blind. So Heather, why does it matter then that the health departments aren't tracking COVID-19 in daycare centers? Well, if you don't know if COVID-19 is spreading in daycare centers, you can't reimpose measures like social distancing and mask wearing to, to stop that spread. And then you get a situation where you can have really several cases of COVID-19, up to a dozen that could cause whole daycare rooms to shut down, making it impossible for parents to work. So uh, one Chicago mom, she was caught in this situation, Meredith Shiver, her 19-month-old son Carter got COVID-19 at the end of March. Eventually, Meredith and her husband also tested positive along with a dozen children at that center. Here's what Meredith told you. We did the most that we could to protect him, and it wasn't enough because we're not choosing as a community to do a little bit more to protect him. Heather, did she feel let down by the lack of data from uh, and guidance from health officials? She absolutely felt let down and she was furious that this case outbreak at her son's daycare in Lincoln Park really happened at a time when city, state and federal officials were removing measures that have been proven to stop the spread of COVID-19, really leaving 
kids like her son, who's too young to be vaccinated against COVID-19, to bear the brunt of COVID. And she's concerned about the long-term effect of COVID, and we don't really have any of those answers either. Uh, Heather, you also spoke with Dr. Zachary Rubin, a pediatrician, about where this lack of data leaves parents. Let's listen. It's a rather complicated, tricky situation for parents to be able to navigate because they may not be able to control that situation as they're sending them off for other people to watch their children. Heather, what can parents do to keep their toddlers and their babies safe? Well, they're really left only with the basics, uh, you know, to g practice good hand hygiene, to keep people home if they're sick, to avoid crowded places where, of course, the chance of contracting COVID-19 is greater. And beyond that, it's really just to stay hopeful and keep their fingers crossed that there will be a COVID-19 vaccine for kids under five, perhaps sometime this summer. But that can seem a long time to wait since these parents have been waiting for more than two years at this point. And toddlers are so good at washing their hands, Heather. Yes, you and I <laughs> both know that, Brandis. We know it very well. All right, Heather Sharon, as always, thanks so much. Thanks, Brandis. And you can read Heather's full story on our website. That's WTTW.com slash news. And now to Paris for some more with members of Chicago's City Council, Paris. Thanks, Brandis. Earlier in the program, we discussed the potential sites for a Chicago casino and the mayor's gas giveaway plan. And we're joined once again by older people Brian Hopkins, Gilbert Viegas, Pat Dowell, and Jason Irvin for much more from City Council. Alderman uh, Viegas and Irvin, you uh, represent uh, the two respective new ward maps uh, that are uh, competing against each other. Alderman Irvin, there's less than a month to go now. Uh, for some kind of agreement struck in city council before it goes to referendum. So is it kind of a foregone conclusion there will be no agreement? I wouldn't say that. I mean, I think that uh, everyone is uh, working toward agreement. Uh, but again, I, I think that's probably a, a question better suited for my colleague uh, as uh, we're ready, willing, and able to have those conversations. And I just think that everyone needs to sit down and uh, calmer heads will prevail. And Alderman Viegas, the difference here is uh, one additional Latino majority ward in the map that you're uh, backing. What, where is the compromise here? Is there one? Yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, uh, Alderman Irvin as well that as long as we all get in a room and talk, I think that we can potentially get to a compromise. Um, you know, we we're, we both are looking at data, uh, disseminating it. Uh, we just have a different opinion as how uh, we want to see the reapportionment. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think that if we can get in a room uh, and try to make it, to, uh, try to get to a compromise, I think we can get there. Alderman Dowell, uh, the group uh, that backed the People's Map is saying that City Council should suspend the rules tomorrow and just have a vote uh, on the maps, even though those maps haven't cleared committee. Is there any chance that something like that's going to happen? Uh, why the, suspend the rules? I mean, we had rules set up at the beginning of this process on how the uh, mapping would take place. Um, we're going down that road and we should stick to the rules that we put in place at the beginning. Um, there's no need to suspend the rules. And, uh, and Alderman, now another map. And, and Alderman Hopkins, so it looks like the talks might uh, heat up again uh, before the deadline here that this goes to the voters. But what is the problem with the voters choosing between these two maps? Personally, I have no problem with the voters choosing. I, I think that's appropriate at this point. In fact, I fully expect the negotiations will continue right up until the 11th hour, uh, just as been mentioned. But in the event that those negotiations don't bear fruit and it goes to the voters, that's fine. You know, uh, it should be up to the voters to break the stalemate. Alderman Irvin, does this come down to like a couple of alder people, a couple of wards, a couple of folks saying, can you draw me a more favorable ward? Can you just like let us in on that? Well, I think that's a that's a question. I think you have to ask the uh, the chairman of the Latino caucus. I mean, uh, the 34 of us have sat down and worked with our neighbors and, and done everything that we can uh, to to bring people along in this process. I think that uh, ultimately they have to make a decision to do something that's in the best interest of Chicago, because I, I just don't see this playing out very well for, for anybody. Um, this this uh, issue will get become highly divisive, uh, will become very nasty, I believe. And that would be unfortunate because you know we are a city of broad shoulders, but uh, you know you can uh, you know you can't unring a bell. And so I'm hopeful that people do get an opportunity to sit down and come to a rational conclusion. But again, uh, as I, as I've stated before, uh, the, the African American community in this city uh, will not live on its knees. 
And, uh, and Alderman Viegas, I mean, is there uh, a proposal that you and the Latino Caucus would back that did not have that additional uh, Latino majority ward that you have in your proposal? Yeah, I think I think that we would have to continue dialogue, just as um, Chairman Urban has mentioned. I think that if we get in a room and, and uh, come to, try to come to a conclusion and compromise, look at data. I mean, look, when you take a look at what the census, the census just reported that there was an undercount of Latinos of 5.5% and 3% 3, 3 African-American and an overcount of uh, Caucasians and Asians. And so uh, if we can look at that new data and continue to analyze it and reapportion it accordingly, uh, I think that we can we can get to a compromise, but we have to have uh, true uh, true discussions uh, and both both parties be willing to to, to discuss uh, ways that we can work together, as as uh, Alderman Irvin has stated. Still, uh, seems to be a demographic issue here. Uh, Alderman Dow, one of your colleagues, has introduced a new ethics ordinance that would really uh, ratchet up the fines that uh, older people have to pay for violating the ethics code. Uh, as much as twenty thousand dollars, they'd have to pay. Uh, is that something that you and your colleagues would support? You know, I can't speak to um, uh, Chairman uh, Michelle Smith's ordinance. She, I believe, is submitting it tomorrow. I have not really reviewed the details of it. You know, I'm going to support, I've been supportive of transparency and good ethics among uh, the city council, among, um, you know, all of us. Uh, so I'm prepared to give serious consideration to what she presented presents tomorrow, but I really haven't seen it. Alderman Hopkins, from what we know, again, it would beef up those fines of $20,000, and an Alderwoman Smith, who's sponsoring this, wants to beef up the office uh, of the Ethics Council so that they really have teeth. Uh, would you support this? Yeah, I'm open to considering it. You know, ultimately, as we've learned in this city, you can't legislate integrity. Unfortunately, if you could do that, um, we would have found a way to pass laws and have everyone follow their conscience. Uh, and do the right thing when no one's looking, which is really the definition of ethics. Um, but if this is something that could provide uh, further disincentive uh, to break the rules, um, sure, it's it's something that we have to consider, and I'm sure we'll have a debate about it. And speaking of ethics, the news today that the ward superintendent for 45th Ward, Alderman uh, Jim Gardner, arrested for allegedly trying to sell a gun while he was uh, uh, on the city clock. Uh, Alderman Irvin, I want to move on to the mm. gang profits ordinance that the mayor has pushed for several months that hasn't really gone anywhere. It's been delayed. It doesn't look like she has the votes. Is, is there uh, an 11th hour um, a boost to this bill that might get it passed, city council? Well, I, I know that there have been some challenges among some of the members uh, of the body in relation to that, but I think that we have to look at what's happening uh, in, in our streets and what we can do uh, to help make our community safer by going after those uh, who are profiting uh, from uh, the illegal activity that is happening, the lives that are being ruined. And yet, um, you know, many don't live in our communities, but yet profit from the pain and misery of a lot of individuals in the community. Um, I, I lost a relative recently uh, to a, a drug overdose, and, and that stuff is real. And the pain and hurt that people go through behind the profits of other people, that's real. And I think we need to, to look at it from a perspective of how can we uh, disrupt the lives of those who want to disrupt the lives of so many Chicagoans uh, as they've been doing for a number of years. And so I'm hopeful uh, through uh, more talks and negotiations that we can get to a point where we honestly can, can go after individuals uh, who are basically doing our communities harm and, and, and living a high life for it. And, and, and our condolences to your family uh, on that, uh, Alderman Irvin. Alderman Viegas, I mean, it's gotten opposition from folks like the ACLU, and then on the complete other side, that head of the FOP, John Catanzara. Uh, is that kind of enough opposition to sink it here? Yeah, I think that it's very rare that you get both the ACLU and FOP uh, opposing a piece of legislation. Uh, members of uh, the body have, uh, major the super majority of the members of the body are not sold on this idea yet. Um, and uh, again, when you have the ACLU and FOP both agreeing that this legislation is bad and detrimental to the, the black and brown communities, uh, I, then, then you have to give, it gives pause and uh, there has to be some serious tweaking in order to get it passed. And this certainly would be a major defeat uh, for Mayor Lightfoot uh, if it does not pass. So uh, we'll watch and see that tomorrow as well as all other city council business. And our thanks to older people Brian Hopkins, Gilbert Villegas, Pat Dowell, and Jason Irvin. Thanks so much. Thank you for having us. And now, Brandis, we toss it back to you.
And Paris city officials are ready to resume installing water meters in Chicago homes. The decision comes nearly three years after Mayor Lori Lightfoot halted the work amid concerns that it was causing lead to pollute the drinking water in thousands of Chicago homes. Joining us now in an exclusive interview to discuss this and more is Chicago Water Commissioner Andrea Chang. Commissioner, thank you for joining us. Uh, so first, tell us how did the city decide that it is now safe to start resuming uh, installing water meters? Sure, sure. So, um, you know, originally the meter save program had been started in 2009. Um, and had about 130,000 meters installed between then and 2019 when it was paused. Um, and it was paused based on preliminary results from a research study that showed a slight elevation in water and lead levels after meters were installed in some homes. And um, we knew that the meters didn't have lead in it and we knew it had to be a different, um, more of a disturbance based factor that was causing this increase. So um, after a little bit of looking into what options we had, um, we were launched, we launched the ultrasonic meter study in 2020 to investigate whether our ultrasonic meters might have less impact on residential lead levels after meter installation. And why did we look at ultrasonic meters? We looked at them because they have no moving parts compared to the original water meters that do have moving parts. And that's um, because those moving parts could disturb the corrosion control coating um, within the pipe. Um, and that coating keeps the lead from reaching the system. So uh, once we were able to get about 200 people into the ultrasonic meter study, um, which took a while because it was during COVID, <laughs> it was launched um, a month before COVID started. So we couldn't get into people's homes right away. Um, we were able to say something statistically significant. Um, we recently got to that point where we had enough data to say from a statistical standpoint that we could confidently restart the program. Uh, with new modifications to protect health and safety. Um, and just for, and, a, go oh, ahead, go Commissioner. Ahead. I was just going to say, and, and those modifications involve mandatory flushing. What we actually found was that um, it's less about meter installation and more about flushing and water usage. Okay, so you, you know then that uh, by using these ultra ultrasonic meters, um, that uh, that disturbance that caused that increased lead level in the water is a lot less likely. Uh, that said, there are still how many, um, <laughs> so many lead lines or uh, water lines that still um, are affected by lead. What is the city doing to ensure that that's not a problem for Chicago households? So I just want to back up. So what we actually found was that uh, the ultrasonic meters and the traditional meters were within the error of measurement um, when it came to lead levels, but that both of those were within the error of seasonal changes in lead levels due to temperature. So the original study found about two parts per billion with traditional meters. We found about 1.2 with ultrasonic uh, parts per billion difference in lead. And uh, what you get from seasonal temperature variation is about three parts per billion. But what we found more importantly was that the uh, flushing that we were asking people to do after they installed a meter in order to get rid of the little lead particles that might come loose when you cut pipe uh, wasn't really being done by folks. But the, for the ones that did flush, they actually had much lower lead levels. So part of what we'll be doing is having a mandatory flush after a, a meter installation, thus rendering that a uh, much more a much safer process and by flush i don't mean the toilet because <laughs> uh, i get that question a lot i mean the faucets showers it could be anything that moves water in the home so um, with that modification along with the uh, distribution of water filters to be on the safe side and testing um, also being the safe side that's going to be the key to um, restarting meter save of course and okay yeah. Yeah. And just, thank you for thank you for clarifying that. Um, so uh, before we run out of time, a couple of other things I wanted to, to be sure we get to. Um, so data obtained by WTTW News, it also shows that city crews have replaced just 74 of the approximately 400,000 lead service lines that are responsible for contaminating Chicagoans tap water since the city's 2020 rollout plan. Uh, what would you say is behind this delay in replacing those lines? I'd say that we just need to correct some of the facts there. So um, it started in 2021. 
the program. Um, and, uh, you know, what we have in terms of programs rolled out is ones that focus on equity. And that's sort of the key, making sure that we have these programs um, appropriate for what works in Chicago. You know, many other cities have gotten more lead service lines replaced, but not in full because they're not taking into account equity. So um, we do have about 74 completed between our equity program as well as our homeowner initiated program. And we're also working on our pilot where we're working on lead service on replacement at the same time as water mains. Um, and anyone can volunteer for that on leadsafechicago.org. And when you say focusing on equity, are you sort of shifting your focus then to be sure that communities that need it more um, are, are seeing those replacements uh, more quickly? Um, we're not shifting it. It's been our focus since the beginning. So, you know, it's really important for Mayor, Mayor, Mayor Lightfoot that we do this equitably and not end up in the situation that some other cities have seen where only those who can afford lead service line replacement get it done. We're focusing on low income through our CDBG grant funding of that equity program. And so we're focusing on people who are least likely to be able to afford to replace it, but are most likely to be impacted. People with uh, children in the home or elevated lead levels are a priority in that program. Okay, plenty to talk about, but unfortunately we are out of time. That's where we'll have to leave it. Our thanks to Commissioner Andrea Chang for joining us. Thank you. Up next, a snapshot of the city's oldest black camera club. But first, a look at the weather. They focus their cameras on people and the landscaped beauty of Southside Parks. Now they're combining their passion for pictures with early Chicago history. The Washington Park Camera Club was organized in 1955. It's the oldest African-American camera club in the city. We met them to find out about their present day dive into the city's past. Here's Mark Vitale with the story. I grew up here. I moved in in 59, so I was four years old. And for us, when your parents say you can go outside and play, that meant that we could go to the park. You know, it was only a block away. So this was my, my backyard. You know, why, why play in the alley when you come out here and play on the grass? Yeah, I shot crime scenes for about 10 years with the uh, police department. But now it's more of a joy. You know, you can sit back and take whatever it is you want to take. We spoke with a few of the 40-plus members of the Washington Park Camera Club in the 345-acre park that gives the club its name. Their latest project blends past and present. They are pairing old views of the park with new inspirations. It's a tribute to the park's creator, 19th-century landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted, who completed the park in 1871. We found out that this was a, a celebration for Olmsted's 200th birthday. And for this magnificent space, and it's still here, it's still pretty much the same way that he left it, you know, very small changes. And what I love about it is that he gave the community the space. In order for you to appreciate the park, you have to get into the uh, a belly of it. There's hidden spaces, and that's what Olmsted was known for. You'll walk through a path. Then all of a sudden the path is going to open up to a lagoon, um, it might be a little creek, green spaces. Olmsted was an artist, a conservationist, and an early abolitionist. This photographic salute to Olmsted is sponsored by the Hyde Park Historical Society and the Chicago-based Terra Foundation for American Art. The project has an enthusiastic supporter in a local historian. Frederick Law Olmsted was really a remarkable uh, human being. He is considered the founder of American landscape architecture, and he had the idea that American parks would be kind of the, the, this like tremendous democratic experiment. During Victorian society, there were few places where people of all backgrounds and classes could actually ever even mingle or meet or you know see each other. But parks were these spaces. They they were the parks that belonged to all the people. The Washington Park Camera Club is made up of both beginners and professionals. It is, as they put it, where great minds click. We form our own community. You shoot your natural instincts. So I'll, I'll say it this way. No matter what my assignment is, if a child walks by or, or, or a, a family with their children, I will stop and take that picture. 
because that's that's something that means a lot to me to see black families out enjoying the, the community see children when I come out I'm talking to people and they're sharing their um, experiences in the park so I'm, I'm shooting them and then the landscapes when you come in a park you take a lot of this for granted but this whole thing was actually a gift from Olmsted. He thought about this 150 years ago. The Chicago Park System is just an amazing resource for the city. Not only just the most incredible places to go, but they are essentially living works of art. Things haven't changed. You know, these are the same locations. Some of these trees are older than the park itself. We took advantage of all of this out here. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Olmstead. <laughs> For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. Landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted also designed Central Park in New York, of course, and the grounds of the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C. He was born 200 years ago today. And today is also the launch of the Washington Park Camera Club's virtual exhibit. It's called South Park, Then and Now. And you can find out more on our website. And we're back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. And that's our show for this Tuesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night at 7. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and have a great evening. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that's proud to serve its community through pro bono legal services. Mm -hmm.